What's up, everybody, and welcome back to OpenStax Algebra and Trigonometry Chapter 13 Practice Test. Let's do it. Write the first four terms of the sequence defined by the recursive formula right here. So we have, I believe this is supposed to say one there. I think it got cut off. We have the first term here, which is negative 14, and we need that first term or, or some term for a recursive formula to find the rest of the terms. So for this one, we need to get the first four terms and using the recursive formula, starting with that first term of negative 14, we can plug and chug into this formula. So negative 14 is gonna go in here, plus two is negative 12 divided by two is negative six. Then to get to the next term, plug in negative six here, negative six plus two is negative four divided by two is negative two. Last but not least, plug in that negative two here. Negative two plus two is zero, divided by two is zero. So those are the first four terms. That's how you do it, done. Is this sequence arithmetic? So if it's arithmetic, there needs to be a common difference, meaning something that we're adding every time or subtracting to get to the next term. From 0.3 to 0.12, it's 0.9 is being added. From here to here, again, it's 0.9. And from here to here, it's again 0.9. So this does look to be an arithmetic sequence, and it does have a common difference of 0.9. That's how you do it. Done. Write a recursive formula for the arithmetic sequence here. Okay, so a recursive formula is going to be as follows for any sort of arithmetic sequence. It's going to be the previous term plus whatever the common difference is, right? So we gotta figure out the common difference. And the way we can do that is we can look at any two consecutive terms, right? We got negative two here. I'm gonna rewrite this as negative 3.5. It's a little easier to see, right? So what's the common difference? It's negative 1.5, or we can say negative three halves. So this can be my recursive formula. Now let's find the 22nd firm for, uh, term. To do that, I'm actually gonna create the explicit formula. It doesn't ask for it, but it's gonna make it a lot easier. My explicit formula would be my first term negative two, plus my common difference, which is negative three halves times n minus one. And to get the 22nd term, we plug in 22 in for n. So 22 minus one is 21. 21 times negative three halves is negative 63 over two. And then we're combining that with negative two. So let's make negative two have a common denominator, make it negative four over two. Negative four plus negative 63 is negative 67 over two. So negative 67 over two is the 22nd term. That's how you do it, done. Is this sequence geometric? Okay, so the way we figure it out, figure out if a sequence is geometric is if there's a common multiplier, AKA a common ratio. So to get from negative two to negative one, I'm multiplying by one half, negative one to negative one half, again, one half. And last but not least, to get from negative one half to negative one fourth, I'm multiplying by one half. So I would say, yes, it's a geometric sequence. And the common ratio, therefore, is that multiplier, which is one half. So that's how you do it, done. Write a recursive formula for the following geometric sequence. So a recursive formula for a geometric sequence is basically we're taking whatever our previous term is and we're multiplying it by whatever the common ratio is. So what is the common ratio? I can look at any two consecutive terms to figure that out. And to get from one to negative one half, I'm multiplying by negative one half. And you can verify that looking at all the rest of the terms, right? Negative one half times negative one half gives me one fourth and so on. So all I gotta do is throw this in front of a sub n minus one, which represents the previous term to a sub n. So there's my recursive formula, done. Use the summation notation to write the sum of the terms this from negative three to 15. So this is really just plugging into essentially a formula. So the summation, we use this symbol sigma, and it's saying from k equals negative three, that's the starting point, and going up to k equals 15. So we throw that value 15 on top, and then we just put this term 3k squared minus 5 sixths k in parentheses, and that's it. That's how you do it with sigma notation, done. Use the formula for the sum of the first n terms of a geometric series to find this. Okay, so here's the formula for the sum of a geometric series. So what we need to start with first is a sub one, the first term, and that can be found right here at the front, which is negative 0.2. Then inside we have one minus the common ratio. What's the common ratio? It's right there, negative five, okay? And then it's to the nth power. What is n? Well, n in this case is seven, right? We're going from one through seven, so there's seven terms, so we raise that to the seventh power. And then that's over one minus my r, which is again, negative five. All right, let's plug this in to Desmos. Here we get negative 2604.2, so negative 2604.2 for the win, boom, done. 
Ramla deposits 3600 into a retirement fund each year. The fund earns 7.5% annual interest compounded monthly. If she opened her account when she was 20 years old, how much will she have by the time she's 55? How much of that amount was interest earned? Okay. So I want to show you guys what they what the back of the book got for this answer because it's incorrect. So what they've got is 140,355.75, right? Uh, and that's the total amount in the account with an interest of 14,355. Now this is incorrect. And I want to tell you uh, how they got this. So the 126,000 is correct, right? That's how much is deposited 35 years from 20 to 55 times 3,600. So we do know that the total amount deposited is 126,000. So the interest earned is going to be whatever the total amount is in the account at the end of this process minus that initial 126,000. But this is it, this is incorrect for the amount and the reason why is what they did with the formula is they actually put in the wrong value for n. So this is a little bit different than the problems that have been given thus far in the back of the book, right? They've got annual interest We've got an annual deposit, but then compounded monthly, okay? So that's where it gets a little bit tricky. So normally we've got our A sub one, which is 3,600, okay? And then we've got the one minus, and my R value is going to be one plus that interest rate, which is 0 0.075 over 12, okay? Because we're compounding it monthly. Then when we raise it to N, what they did in the back of the book to get this calculation is they just did 35, right? Because it is 35 years. But what you have to account for is it's compounded monthly. So you'd really need to multiply it by 12, like technically with the formula, right? But the problem with applying it as it's been presented in the book is now we've got annual payments and we're talking about monthly compounding. And you get a crazy number when you do the formula this way, the you know more kind of shown in the, in the back of the book or in the instructions of the book, which gives you like 7 million something, which is also incorrect. So one way you can get close to this, you can change this to a monthly payment and make it $300 per month and then compound it out. And you're going to get somewhere in the ballpark of this amount still being, still having one minus R on the bottom, right? One minus that one plus 0 0.0. 75 over 12. So this is another way. But again, it's just not exactly going to line up because this slightly changes if you're doing 300 every month. It's not really like one set deposit of 3,600 that's going to entirely be accruing interest. So what I did is I created a spreadsheet just to show you guys kind of how to think about this as investing and, and how much interest is going to accrue depending on when you put in each 3,600. So let's check that out now. So here you can see, right, the first payment of 3,600 that's in there for 35 years. I put in that 3,600 and then I applied this sort of like compounding interest formula. So you can see the first deposit actually grows to this massive value of almost 50,000. And then the second year grows to that and so on and so forth, all the way to the last year where it's deposited at that 0.075% compounded monthly. And anyways, giving the total, we get this total value, right? 634,261. Point twenty cents, and again to minus the one hundred twenty six thousand, we get this value for the interest five hundred and eight thousand two hundred sixty one. So, anyways, that's how you do it. That's why it's wrong in the back of the book. If you're wondering, boom, done. A buyer of a new sedan can custom order the car by choosing from five different exterior colors, three different interior colors, two sound systems, and three motor designs and manual or automatic transmission. How many choices does the buyer have? So this is the counting principle, and we're gonna take each of these choices and the number of options in each case. So we've got five for exterior colors, three for interior, two for the sound system, three for the motor designs, and then two for manual or automatic. And then we're gonna take the product of all five of these. So five times three is 15, times two is 30, times three is 90, times two is 180. So 180 is the winner, done. A music group needs to choose three songs to play at the annual battle of the bands. How many ways can they choose their set if they have 15 songs to pick from? So the question here is, does order matter? Now, I'm going to argue that order would normally matter because if you're choosing a set, you also want to choose like, hey, how are the three songs going to be organized? That's going to make a difference. What do we want to start with? What do we want to end with? Which would technically be a permutation. However, the the book has done it with a combination so all they're trying to choose is just their three songs they don't care about the order so i'm just explaining that but basically this is a combination where our n value is 15 and we're choosing three and my formula is 
n 15 factorial n factorial over n minus r 15 minus 3 which is 12 factorial times r factorial which is 3 factorial and we can do this by hand so 15 factorial is 15 times 14 times 13 times 12 multiplication countdown right 14 13 12 all the way down to 1 12 factorial is 12 times all the way down to 1 12 11 10 9 right and then 3 factorial is 3 times 2 times 1 now what you might notice right off the bat all of these numbers and all of these are going to be repetitive and they're going to cancel out so we're left with 15 times 14 times 13 on the bottom 3 2 1 okay now we can do a little cross simplification 15 and 3 reduces to 5 14 and 2 reduces to 7 so we got left with 5 times 7 times 13 we'll do it by hand just for fun 35 times 13 3 times 35 is 105 10 times 35 is 350 giving us a final answer of 455 different options for sets that's how you do it done how many distinct ways can the word evanescence be arranged if the anagram must end with the letter e okay so here's the dealio right we've got one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven letters but this e is is not moving right it's got to end with an e so that e is there so really we're arranging 10 letters okay so we got e stuck at the end and then the rest of these we have to look at now obviously there's 10 factorial ways to arrange 10 letters but then we have some repetition right so here we have one two three different e's so to counteract that or to factor that in we have to divide by three factorial we also have two n's so we also need another two factorial last but not least we also have two c's so we need another two factorial right there all right now we got our expression let's plug it into desmos and there we get our final answer 151,200 so 151,200 is the answer done find the seventh term of this binomial without fully expanding it so we're going to use the binomial theorem and remember the coefficient for the seventh term we're going to start with combination 13 which is the same as this power and remember the seventh term actually is going to have a six on the bottom because the first term is 13 0 second term is 13 1 so on and so forth and then we're going to take that first term x squared and it's we're raising it to the power that is the difference of these two numbers 13 minus 6 is 7 and then that second term negative 1 half is going to be raised to the bottom value which is 6 all right so we're going to find out what 13 choose 6 comes out to be negative 1 half to the 6th power and take the product of those two to get our coefficient let's do that now so here we get the fraction value 429 over 16 so our final coefficient is 429 over 16 and then as we multiply this in we have x to the 14th and that's the seventh term done what is the probability of landing on an odd number so remember probability we're going to try and define all the ways that we can get an odd number basically how we can win in this context right so we got one three five and seven so there are four ways to win out of the total number of options there are which there are one through seven or seven options so my probability is four out of seven that's how you do it done what is the probability of landing on blue or an odd number okay so i think this is not blue i'm just throwing it out there i think blue is these two so blue is one and four or an odd number now we already counted one as blue so we don't double count it so we could also get three five and seven so how many choices are that one two three four five and again probability is the number of ways to get what we want in this case which is blue or odd um, out of the total number of possibilities seven and that's it that's my probability five out of seven done a bowl of candy holds 16 peppermint 14 butterscotch and 10 strawberry flavored candies suppose a person grabs a handful of seven candies what is the percent chance that exactly three are butterscotch okay so let's break it down first of all we have 16 plus 14 plus 10 which is 40 total okay so we want to choose exactly three butterscotch out of seven so that means first combination of the first 14 we want to choose exactly three but what that means is we also need for the rest to be not butterscotch right and what are what are the non butterscotch it's the strawberry and the peppermint that is choosing from 26 we want the remaining four to be from those. And then to get the final percentage, we're dividing by the com all the different combinations 
choosing from 40, choosing seven candies in total. All right, let's plug this into Desmos. So here we get 0.292 if we round it up. And as a percent, that is 29.2%. And that's how you do it. Done. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. And if you did, please click that like button. If you want to see more from the Scalar Learning channel, make sure to click subscribe. Thank you guys so much for joining. And I'll see you in the next video. Take it easy.